Dedication and Preface of Fables in Rhyme for Little Folks by Jean de La Fontaine. Translated by W. T. Larned. Read for LibriVox.org by Karen Savage. Dedication. To all little Americans with the hope that they may become better acquainted with our friends the French. A Preface for Parents. La Fontaine composed the most entertaining fables ever written in any language, and made them a model of literary perfection. Yet our translators and compilers have somehow neglected him. His fables are lyric poetry of a high order, and this alone has doubtless been a barrier to a better acquaintance with his work when transferred to our own tongue. Done into prose, the fables are no longer La Fontaine, but take their place with the many respectable, dull translations which English readers try to admire, because they are classics, though the soul that made them such has been separated from the dead body. It has seemed to me that while the full enjoyment of La Fontaine must always be reserved for those who can read him in French, it might be possible at least to convey something of his originality and blithe spirit through the medium of light verse. In making the attempt I am fully aware of my temerity and the criticism it will invite. To excuse the one and to meet the other, I have taken refuge in the term adaptation, even though the word applies only in part to my paraphrases. Some of the fables in this book are translations in a true sense, and keep closely to the text. From others I have erased such political, mythological, and literary allusions, in which La Fontaine abounds, as are either obsolete or unintelligible to a child. But my chief literary sin, if sin it be, is twofold. In the first place, I have departed wholly from the metrical arrangements of the originals, substituting therefore a variety of forms in line and stanza that more accord with the modern and American ear. In the second place, I have had the hardihood, as in the line and the gnat, to modify the elegance of the original with phrases more appropriate to our contemporary beasts. Animal talk, I feel sure, has lost something of its stateliness since the days when our French author overheard it. The owl is no less pedantic, perhaps, but the lion certainly has declined in majesty, along with our human kings. For these offences La Fontaine, who forgave every one, is bound to forgive me. The most good-humoured Frenchman, he could condone all faults but dullness. That offence against French fundamental principles invariably put him to sleep, whether the boar who buttonholed him was a servant of the Sorbonne, or just an ordinary ass. One thing more. This little collection from his two hundred and forty fables is meant, first of all, for children. In assembling it, no fable was admitted that has not been approved by generations of the young and old. No apologue addressed to the mature intelligence alone, or framed to fit the society of his day, is here included. Many books which men have agreed to call classics are seldom taken down from the shelves. It is otherwise with La Fontaine. His fables were eagerly read by the great men and women of his time, and are still read and enjoyed all the world over. The causes of this lasting popularity are not obscure. From the earliest period, whether in India, Greece, Arabia, or Rome, the fable has pleased and instructed mankind. It told important truths, easily perceived, in an entertaining way, and often said more in a few words than could be said through any other kind of writing. Now no one person is the author of the fables we know so well. Aesop did not write the fables bearing his name. There is even reason to believe that Aesop is himself a fable. At any rate, the things ascribed to him are the work of many hands, and have undergone many changes. These old stories of animals began to be written so long ago, and the history of them is so vague and confusing, that only in recent years have scholars at last been able to trace them, and to fix their authorship. The significant thing to keep in mind is that, for twentieth-century readers, the best fables are not merely the best ones ever written, but the best ones rewritten. In other words, the fable was for centuries an old story in a rough state, and the writers who have made it most interesting are the writers who told it over again in a manner that makes it art. A Greek named Babrius, of whom almost nothing is known, is remembered because he collected and versified some of the so-called fables of Aesop. A Roman slave named Phaedrus also put these fables into Latin verse, and his work today is a textbook in our colleges. Among modern writers, it was reserved for La Fontaine to take these ancient themes and make them his own, just as Molière, taking his own wherever he found it, borrowed freely from the classics for his greatest plays, just as Shakespeare reformed forgotten tales with the glow and splendour of surpassing genius, so La Fontaine turned to India, Greece, Italy, and furnishing the old fables and facetious tales, refreshed them with his originality. Some of them were his own inventions, but for the most part they were Aesop and Phaedrus made over by poetic art, and vivified with a wit and humour characteristically French. 
But if La Fontaine's fame endures, it is not alone that he was the greatest lyric poet of a great literary period. Apart from the wit and fancy of his creations, apart from the philosophy, wisdom, and knowledge of human nature that so delighted Molière, Boileau, and Racine, his fables disclose the goodness and simplicity of one who lived much with nature, and cared nothing for the false splendours of the court. Living most of his life in the country, the woods, and streams, and fields had been a constant source of inspiration. He saw animals through the eyes of a naturalist and poet, and when he came to make them talk, the little fishes talked like little fishes, not like whales. With Shakespeare's banished Frenchman in the forest of Arden, he finds tongues in trees, books in the running brooks, sermons in stones, and good in everything. An anecdote often told of him aptly illustrates his habit of mind. He was late in coming to a fashionable dinner, and his excuse was this. I hope you will pardon me, he said. I was detained at the funeral of an aunt, and I could not come until the ceremony was over. This was not a pleasantry, but the truth. He had been watching an ant hill, and was so absorbed in observing a dead ant carried off by the living colonists for burial, that he had forgotten his engagement. The first six volumes of the fables, published in 1668, when he was forty-seven, and in Paris, were an immediate and brilliant success, at a time when French genius was in full flower. But the literary men of that golden age got their pecuniary reward not from the public, but from patrons. Later in life, when La Fontaine at last was graciously recognized by the Grand Monarch, he appeared before the royal presence to receive his due. Even then, with his usual absent-mindedness, he forgot to bring the book he was to present, and left behind him in the carriage the purse of gold the King bestowed upon him. However, the fables brought him in much fame and friendship. Everybody loved La Fontaine. Favourite of great lords and ladies, the court of Louis the Fourteenth could not make him otherwise than natural. Poor and improvident, poverty had no pangs for him. No sorrow ever gave him a sleepless hour. To the last he lived up to his nickname, Bonhomme. And it is the gentle and good man who is always looking out at us from the fables he refashioned for all time. William Trowbridge Larned, New York, July 1918 End of Dedication and Preface This recording is in the public domain. The Miller, His Son, and the Ass From Fables and Rhyme for Little Folks by Jean de la Fontaine Translated by W. T. Larned for LibriVox.org Recording by Alana Jordan The Miller, His Son, and the Ass A miller and son once set out for the fair To sell a fine ass they had brought up with care and the way that they started made everyone stare. To keep the ass fresh so the beast would sell dear, on a pole they slung him, it surely seemed queer. He looked up, with heels up, like some huge chandelier. One person who passed them cried out in great glee, Was there ever anything so silly, said he? Can you guess who the greatest ass is of those three? The miller at once put the brute on the ground, and the ass who had liked to ride t'other way round, complained in language of curious sound. No matter, the miller now made his son ride, while he followed after or walked alongside. Then up came three merchants, the eldest one cried, Get down from there, young fellow, I never did see such manners a greybeard walks where you should be he should ride you should follow just take that from me dear sirs quoth the miller i'd see you content he climbed to the saddle on foot the boy went three girls passed said one do you see that old gent there he sits like a bishop i say it's a shame while that boy trudging after seems more than half lame Little girl, said the miller, go back whence you came. Yet this young creature so worked on his mind that he wanted no woman to call him unkind, and he said to his son, Seat yourself here, behind. With the ass bearing double, they jogged on again, and once more met a critic who said, It is plain, only dunces would give their poor donkey such pain. He will die with their weight. It's a shame and a sin, for their faithful servant they care not a pin. 
They'll have nothing to sell at the fair but his skin. Dear me, said the miller, what am I to do? Must I suit the whole world and the world's father too? Yet it must end some time, so I'll see the thing through. Both father and son now decided to walk, while the ass marched in front with a strut and a stalk. Yet the people who passed them continued to talk, said one to another, Look there, if you please, how they wear out their shoes while their ass takes his ease. Were there ever, do you think, three asses such as these? Said the miller, You're right, I'm an ass, it is true. Too long have I listened to people like you, but now I am done with the whole kit and crew. Let them blame me or praise me, keep silent or yell. My goings and comings they cannot compel. I will do as I please. So he did and did well. End of fable. End of fables and rhyme for little folks by Jean de La Fontaine, translated by W. T. Larned. This recording is in the public domain. The Frog Who Wished to Be as Big as the Ox, from Fables in Rhyme for Little Folks, by Jean de La Fontaine, translated by W. T. Larned. There was a little frog whose home was in a bog, and he worried because he wasn't big enough. He sees an ox and cries, that's just about my size. If I stretch myself, say, sister, see me puff. So he blew, 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 saying, sister, will that do? But she shook her head, and then he lost his wits. For he stretched and puffed again till he cracked beneath the strain, and burst and flew about in little bits. End of the frog who wished to be as big as the ox. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ben Abel, Columbus, Ohio, mycast.blogspot.com. The Acorn and the Pumpkin, from Fables in Rhyme for Little Folks, by Jean de La Fontaine, translated by W. T. Larned, read for LibriVox.org, by Karen Savage. The Acorn and the Pumpkin Once there was a country bumpkin, who observed a great big pumpkin to a slender stem attached. While upon an oak tree nourished, little acorns grew and flourished. Bah! said he, that's badly matched. If, despite my humble station, I'd a hand in this creation, Pumpkins on the oaks would be, and the acorn, light and little, on this pumpkin stem so brittle would be placed by clever me. Then, fatigued with so much thought, he rest beneath the oak tree sought. He soon in slumber found repose, but alas, an acorn falling on the spot where he lay sprawling, hit him plump upon the nose. Up he jumped, a wiser bumpkin. Gosh, he said, suppose a pumpkin came a-falling on my face. After all, if I had made things, I'll allow that I'm afraid things might be somewhat out of place. End of the Acorn and the Pumpkin. This recording is in the public domain. The City Mouse and the Country Mouse From Fables and Rhyme for Little Folks by Jean de La Fontaine Translated by W. T. Larned Read for LibriVox.org The City Mouse and the Country Mouse a city mouse with ways polite, a country mouse invited, to sup with him and spend the night, said country mouse, delighted, in truth it proved a royal treat, with everything that's good to eat. Alas, when they had just begun to gobble their dinner, a knock was heard that made them run, the city mouse seemed thinner, and as they scampered and turned tail, he saw the country mouse grow pale. The knocking ceased, a false alarm, the city mouse grew braver. "'Come back!' he cried. "'No, no, the farm, where I'll not quake or quaver, suits me,' replied the country mouse. "'You're welcome to your city house.'" End of The City Mouse and the Country Mouse This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Brianna Roop, Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin. BriannaBird.blogspot.com The Lion and the Gnat From Fables in Rhyme for Little Folks By Jean De La Fontaine, translated by W. T. Larned, read for LibriVox.org, recording by Alana Jordan. The Lion and the Gnat The lion once said to the gnat, you brat, clear out just as quick as you can now, scat. If you meddle with me, I will not guarantee that you won't be slammed perfectly flat. 
do you see? Said the gnat, because you're called king, you thing, you fancy that you will make me take wing. Why, an ox weighs much more, yet I drive him before. When I get good and ready to sting, now roar. Then loudly his trumpet he blew, and woo, how fiercely and fast at his foe he flew. From the tail to the toes he draws blood as he goes, then he starts into sting and to chew his nose. Sir Lion was mad with the pain, in vain. He roared and he foamed and he shook his mane. All the beasts that were nigh fled in fear from his cry, but the gnat only stung him again in the eye. He looked and laughed as he saw, ha ha, the lion self-torn by his tooth and claw, so his majesty's hide with his own blood was dyed, said the gnat, shall I serve you up raw or fried? It's finished, the lion's loud roar is o'er, he's bitten and beaten, he's sick and sore, but a spider's web spread, trapped the gnat as he sped, with the news, he will never fight more, he's dead. End of fable. This recording is in the public domain. The Grasshopper and the Ant from Fables and Rhyme for Little Folks by Jean de La Fontaine, translated by W. T. Learned. The grasshopper, singing all summer long, now found winter stinging and ceased in his song. Not a morsel or crumb in his cupboard, so he shivered and ceased in his song. Miss Ant was his neighbor, to her he went. Oh, you're rich from labor, and I've not a cent. Lend me food, and I vow I'll return it, though at present I have not a cent. The ant's not a lender, I must confess. Her heart's far from tender to one in distress. So she said, Pray, how passed you the summer, that in winter you come to distress. I sang through the summer, Grasshopper said, but now I am glummer, because I've no bread. So you sang, sneered the ant. That relieves me. Now it's winter. Go dance for your bread. End of the Grasshopper and the Ant. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ben Ebel, Columbus, Ohio, mycastnose.blogspot.com.